Hello, everyone. Oh, is this on? Hello? Ah, it is on. Fantastic turnout today, and we've got a fantastic uh, lecture lined up for you. So I'm just going to go through a short introduction for our speaker today, as well as some other sort of technical things that you can do as well. Um, so the agenda today is first I give the introduction, then Professor Alex will, Cowan will give us a talk from about five past six to 6.45. And then we have 15 minutes for question, questions and answers. And then at seven, we have some drinks planned afterwards, right? Just, just outside. Yeah, so please stay for some drinks and discussions. Um, so welcome to this uh, tonight's event on sustainable fuels and energy um, hosted by the Energy Futures Lab. Imperial's Global Energy Institute. This is part of a series of evening lectures hosted by the Institute relating to the different research themes. So we're delighted so many of you could join us in person and online. My name is Dr. Andreas Kafizis, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry, as well as being one of the research theme leads for the Energy Futures Lab Sustainable Power Research Theme. We are very pleased to have with us Professor Alex Cowan, who leads, oh sorry, is the director of the UK solar, solar Fuels Network and leads the technology development program of the UKRI Interdisciplinary Centre for Circular Chemical Economy. He leads an active research group at the University of Liverpool that develops and studies catalysts for the sustainable production of fuels. In, the, in a moment, I'll hand over to Professor Cowan to give his presentation. We'll then move to a question and answer session. If you're watching online, please submit any questions via the Q&A function. If you see a question from another attendee that interests you, please press the like button so that we take the most popular questions. And for those of you in the room, we'll just be moving the microphone around. So just raise your hand. Finally, this event is being recorded and will be made available on the Energy Futures Lab YouTube channel. We would encourage you to share that recording with colleagues who weren't able to make it here tonight. Now it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Professor Alex Cowan. Thank you, Andres. Can you hear me OK? Excellent. Oops. So first of all, I'd like to just say Thank you for the kind invitation to join you tonight. It's a bit of echo on this. Does that sound all right? OK, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to join you tonight. Um, it's great to be at Imperial to hear about some of the work that's been going on in chemistry in this field. This is obviously one of the leading centres in the UK in this area, so it's been a really great day. And I just hope I can keep to the timings that Andreas has laid out. I'm notorious for running over or running short, so let's just see what happens. OK, so today I want to give no, is do we have a clicker or an actually because the mouse is quite short, we, we can't actually touch the button without getting feedback. I can just leave. Uh -huh. OK, so today I wanted to give a talk on sustainable fuels and chemicals, and I, I want to give the talk in two parts. I'm aware that we might be quite a mixed audience. So the first part's going to be pretty general, and the idea is to give an overview of the concept of solar and also general renewable driven fuel synthesis. And then in the second part, I want to focus in really on carbon dioxide chemistry and really look at carbon dioxide electrochemistry. And there'll be a little bit of carbon dioxide photochemistry in there. So the first half is more general, the second half is more technical. So as I say, we're going to start off with the general introduction to solar fuels and I think actually I want to try and get across the breadth of different approaches to making a solar fuel or a solar chemical because often we have a tendency in science and engineering to focus in on our particular favourite avenue and our particular favourite pathway. And I have these as well, but in roles with the Solar Fuels Network, we get to see the, the breadth of science that's going on. And I want to try and get some of that across. Then going to have a look at the breadth of different products that you could potentially make. So historically, as a community, we've worked on the simplest fuel that we can think of, which is hydrogen, but perhaps we can go beyond that and have a look at some alternative fuels. As I say, we'll finish up with a focus on CO2 reduction. 
So I don't think I particularly need this part for the Energy Futures Lab, but it's always useful to remind ourselves of why we work in an area or, or why we're doing something. And really, when we're thinking about why we're working in renewable fuels and renewable energy, we need to think about what's the demand for the energy going to look like in the future. And we do know that global demand for energy will continue to grow. And regardless of any energy saving that we put in, we know that increase in energy use directly correlates to GDP. And of course, people are going to want to improve their standards of living. That's entirely right. And with that, they're going to want to use up more energy. So we have as our currently our baseline energy use, and it's likely we're going to need to find resources to increase on this quite significantly. And we need to balance this in a sustainable way. We can't just continue on with, with uh, our current approaches. We're going to need to find a way to have sustainable energy resources. And you'll be aware that there's plenty of options here. There's plenty of energy resources we could look at. So hopefully this is working. We have our traditional finite resources on the right, but we of course have our perpetual energy resources. And this diagram is looking at the total annual uh, 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 energy available, and it's given as a rate. So it's given in, in terawatts. And in the center is the green dot, which is the average world energy consumption. And this was a few years ago, so it was 16 terawatts. It's actually gone up a fair amount since then, but it's the right sort of ballpark. And what we want to take away from this diagram is that this is the size of the solar energy resource. So an absolutely massive resource in comparison to the required energy consumption for humanity. So we have an opportunity to reach our development goals to increase our energy usage, but just to make use of renewable resources and solar could be our key one and it can be complemented by other resources depending on your location. So it could be, for example, wind or hydro. And if we think about cost, I was actually quite shocked when I started to look up these numbers. The cost of solar energy is really quite low. So we're looking at solar photovoltaics and here we've got the auction database numbers and this is from sort of IRENA and it goes up to 2021 and look at the auction database numbers the dollars per kilowatt hour they're now well below the region where fossil fuel energy production typically sits in this gray area so our solar energy is both abundant and our conversion technology to make electricity is quite cheap so dollars per kilowatt hour is quite cheap and this isn't specific to solar actually all our major renewables have really come down in price. So we're looking at onshore winds, offshore winds, and they're all at or below the fossil fuel parity price point here. Which leads to the question, what's constraining uptake? Obviously, there's time scale for installations and there's requirements for space. But if we have such a vast resource, we're only going to need a small fraction of land mass. And we need to take that into account. Wrong computer. What makes the real difference is the need for the storage technologies. Regardless of our renewable approach, there's going to be fluctionality in the supply. And with solar, we have a specific problem. It's seasonal. So here's the data, the average installation taken from the NASA website for a couple of different places. You can guess where I was going to when I prepared this slide. It wasn't Kampala to give you a clue. So here we have it for Liverpool, Kampala, which is around about the equator and Uppsala in Sweden. And what you'll notice is that the solar energy is abundant for parts of the year, but for large parts of the year, we're really going to struggle to have significant supply. So unless we want to transfer all our converted energy supplies from equatorial countries across to the, to the northern and the southern hemispheres, we're going to need to find seasonal storage capacity and very, very large amounts of this. And that presents a particular problem. We're going to need to store energy on an absolutely massive scale. So we're going to need to find technologies which have a very high energy density. And chemical fuels are an obvious solution to this. So we're all familiar with the concept of a chemical fuel. And I haven't included the traditional Ragon plot that you'll often see, but those will show you very clearly that the chemical fuels have some of the highest energy densities, so significantly higher than many of the electrochemical energy technologies. And that means that if we could produce our fuel using solar energy, we have something that we can store for seasons. We can store many common chemical fuels for prolonged periods. 
Humanity's done this for a very long time. Methane we've stored for very long periods, liquid carbon fuels for very long periods as well. And we're particularly good at this. So the concept that we want to talk about today is using sunlight to drive the generation of the fuel. We can then utilize the fuel and regenerate our feedstock. So this is both important from the standard condition, uh, uh, what we talked about earlier from an energy perspective, but it's also important from an elemental sustainability perspective. We're looking at a circular cycle in principle here. So we could have something like water. We're going to take it through to oxygen and hydrogen using our energy from the sun. And then we're going to recombine the oxygen and hydrogen on demand, get our energy back out and regenerate our feedstocks. So what might this look like? Well, this is the sort of eventual scheme we hope society might end up with. So by the day, the sunlight's being used with whichever technology is successful, and it might not be that there's a single technology that's successful, and we'll see quite a few different options coming up in the future slides. But our technology is used to produce our chemical fuel. And if this is hydrogen, we might be storing this, perhaps using compression or liquefaction. It's available and then when we get to nighttime, we can have fuel cells to regenerate for electricity generation. We can use our hydrogen if we wanted to in transportation, if we felt that that was the way society should go. And we can use it in heating, of course. And we're well aware also of the wider uses in hydrogen in society in the chemicals industry. So potentially we have a way to generate our fuel, use it on demand, and we could do this in a localised manner as well which is another big, big advantage. But what will our actual technology look like? If I'm thinking about solar fuels, I can draw a generic cartoon and you can tell it's a generic cartoon because it's got a smiley sun on it. So we'd have some sort of material or combination of materials that can take the sunlight and initially absorb it. We can break it down into very simple steps. This might be a semiconductor, this might be a small molecule. There's a whole range of different options. But the first step is going to be absorption of the sunlight and conversion of this into a chemical potential energy that we can use. So, for example, in a semiconductor, it could be excitation of an electron from the valence band to a conduction band. And that would leave behind an oxidizing hole and a reducing electron. And those species could be used then to drive chemical reactions, electrochemical half reactions. And in this case, the catalysis steps could be water oxidation. So water going to oxygen and four protons and four electrons. And then we could have a second catalyst site, which would have proton reduction to make our hydrogen, making up our overall reaction for water splitting. So for whatever the technology system we're going to look at, we're going to look for these three key steps, light absorption, taking these charges and getting them to a catalytic center, so the separation, and then eventual catalysis. I have a really creaky bit of floor here. It's really off-putting, sorry. <laughs> Wrong way. So this is a slide I've stolen from Erwin Rise, and some of you may recognize it. It's, it's one I think is particularly good, and I tried to remake it several times. I just thought, actually, it's really good. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna nick it. It shows really nicely that there's many different ways to do solar fuel production. And we just look at hydrogen, there's many different technologies and we've categorized them into three types here. And we're gonna have a quick look in the first part of this talk at the three different types. And I'll give a few examples about where we're working in the UK, not necessarily from my lab. I thought it'd be nice to try and show more widely what's happening in the UK. So a few other examples, and maybe some faces that we'll recognize as well. So if we think about, the first system that we might consider, a photovoltaic plus an electrolyzer, here we can look for our three steps. So we're going to have a light absorption and our initial separation of charges in the photovoltaic device, and then a completely different device, our electrolyzer, which contains our two catalytic centers to do our chemistry, to do our actual electrochemistry here, to make our fuel. So we're going to have two main components and they're gonna be wired up together. And what we'll probably recognize is that I can go out and I can buy a photovoltaic today. I can go out and I can buy an electrolyzer of reasonable quality today and I could integrate them 
and that will work. So this is the, the higher TRL end of the spectrum, and we'll look at the lower TRL in the end. The problems we have here is potentially that this is going to be at the costlier end per, for dollars per kilogram fuel or pounds per kilogram fuel. And to sort of give you an idea of where we're at with this sort of technology, we are indeed integrating these now. So I've taken this from a project that we've been involved with for a number of years now called Sea Fuel, which is based out in Tenerife, is our main site. And there we have a seawater electrolysis plant. That's a little bit unusual. I'll come to that point in a second. But it's a plant that uses primarily solar energy. Anyone who's been to Tenerife will know it has wonderful solar resource. It also has a lot of wind as well. So it does use wind too. And it uses this in an electrolyzer. And this electrolyzer then powers a fleet of vehicles for driving around the site. And soon it's going to be upgraded for powering a, actually a small fleet of buses for the island as well. So this level of technology exists. You can construct this. There's a, a company in Scotland who was commissioned to do this. And then we partner up with experts in, in the system side who actually then do the integration. But there's still technology challenges here and ways that we can try and improve this. So I mentioned this uses seawater. And the reason that we use seawater was because we wanted to see if it was possible primarily. Because when you're on an island, seawater is an abundant resource. So if you're going to split water, can, can you make use of the most abundant one? And if you just stick seawater or any slightly dirty water into a standard electrolyzer, you will very soon not have an electrolyzer, or you will just have a very expensive shipping container. Because the electrodes have very low tolerances to impurities such as chloride. So where we are in the field at the moment with the electrolyzer technologies is we have limitations with the materials, particularly in the electrolyzer. So some of these are related to the fact that we have to have very high purities for the membranes, for the electrode materials themselves, and we won't have time in this talk to go through all the details of all the challenges, but I encourage you to have a look at this report here, the materials for end-to-end -end hydrogen report that Ivan was involved with with Henry Royce about a year or two ago, which highlights all the problems and challenges and opportunities for material scientists and electrolyzers. And one of these is impurities, but perhaps the biggest one is that this electrolyzer here in this shipping container just back here is a PEM electrolyzer and it contains a large amount of precious metals, in particular iridium. And what you may be aware of is that iridium, wrong computer again. Get the hang of this computer soon. What you may be aware of is that iridium is only mined at very low levels, several hundred tons a year. And if we go back to our 16 terawatts and we say, OK, we only want to take a tiny, tiny fraction of that 16 terawatts and send it through a green hydrogen supply, so water electrolysis, maybe one terawatt, we're going to need to use several years worth of iridium to make that capacity. In fact, about 40 years worth. And there's a very good paper on this in Nature Energy a few years ago that looked at the resources available, the different elements. And iridium is a big, big barrier, the amount of iridium we need to use. So there's fantastic work happening in the UK. And just to highlight Laurie King, who's up at Manchester Met now, who's doing some really nice work around this area, trying to lower iridium content in the materials and trying to use these. So here she's made a pyrochlor material, which is actually quite interesting. One of the problems with non uh, iridium oxide based materials is the dissolution rate tends to be much higher. But this is an unusual one in that the activity actually increases as it dissolves up. So it's really quite an interesting material. And some fantastic work happening around the UK now trying to thrift this iridium or in some cases remove it completely to work in acid environments. So the PV and the electrolyzer is one pathway, and we're going to come back to electrolyzers in the last part of the talk, but we're going to look at them for carbon dioxide chemistry. The next way we could look at is a photoelectrochemical cell. I'm going to show something from our lab now. So a photoelectrochemical cell, it sort of sits part way between the extremes of the technologies. So in a photoelectrochemical cell, we're going to now integrate the catalyst onto the light absorber directly. So we're going to cut down the number of wires. And the idea is we're going to lower the system complexity and hopefully lower the cost in doing this. So what we will have is semiconductor materials which absorb solar energy and they may be anodes. So they may be materials which drive the water oxidation reaction, so photoanodes, or they may be photocathodes, so materials which drive the hydrogen evolution reaction. 
And we're going to use two of these materials and link these up. And the hope is that we can make this system a bit simpler, but it sets new constraints on our solar energy absorbent material. Of course, now we need it to be stable in water. We need it to be able to survive under these oxidizing and reducing conditions. So this is an example from our lab where we've used one of the more, more sort of uh, fashionable, I guess, photovoltaic absorbent materials at the moment, antimony selenide, and used this and essentially buried a photovoltaic junction behind a TO2 protective capping layer to make it so that it can survive in water. And whereas in a photovoltaic, you'd have an electrical contact to draw the electrons out and use these in an external circuit. Here we've put our catalyst directly onto a porous structure, and it's a catalyst from the University of Cambridge for hydrogen evolution. And we can use this to make hydrogen directly onto the structure. But there's a couple of problems. You can see it's still got a high level of complexity, multi-layers, each has to be very carefully designed. And if you're in the field, you'll know, actually these current densities are pretty poor several milliamps per square centimetre. So we're at a lower TRL level, but potentially a very interesting one. We've got rid of the platinum we'd often use in an electrolyzer of hydrogen evolution and use the nickel based catalyst. I said you might recognize some faces. <laughs> you can do the same for the water oxidation side. So you can have photoanodes and my photoanodes are are nowhere near as good as many other people's and I sort of highlight one of the nicer ones recently has come from Imperial College from Salvers Group actually. So bismuthanidate based material with a nickel iron oxyhydroxide catalyst on the surface and now you can see really quite nice and in the photoelectrochemical community this is pretty good stability on the order of hours so we're getting really quite nice oxygen evolution happening on these materials. So you can go up a level of complexity sorry, down a level of complexity with these devices, and we can still get things that work, but it's pre-commercialization stage. So if we're thinking about simplifying the system, the last sets of systems still had multi-layers. There was still the need to put down very fine layers of, of uh, oxides or protecting layers, really control where the catalysts went. And those single images don't do the work justice that's gone into that. So that's one PhD student optimizing each step, making sure the charges transfer at the correct rate, getting the catalyst loadings correct and making these things work. So it's still relatively complex systems. Can we go simpler still, which is now to integrate the catalysts directly on to a single light absorber? And this is some work back to Liverpool. So this is based on a polymer, which one of my colleagues in the in our department, Andy Cooper works on a lot. They call P10. It's been worked on down here at Imperial as well. It's a sulfone light absorbing polymer. And if you control the polymerization carefully, and if you deposit catalysts carefully onto this material, you can actually do complete water oxidation on the single material. And you can see that this has potential to be a very cheap and simple type system now. So whereas before we've had to have wires, we've had to have solar panels connected up to our electrolyzer, now potentially we could have something as simple as a plastic bag with our catalyst in it. We've got to think about gas management. We're making hydrogen and oxygen together, but we're not quite at the levels where we're making so much hydrogen we have to worry at this stage. But you can see it could be a very cheap, a very simple way to make a device. But the amounts of hydrogen and oxygen that we make are low very low. So I've chosen a polymer based photocatalyst. We could have higher rates of hydrogen and oxygen evolution using inorganic materials. But I think it's kind of fun that we've got a polymer one here because it's actually able to do the complete water splitting. So the, when I was asked to give this presentation, I was asked to give an overview of, of the field. And I think what I want to get across with this, and I've spent quite a long time on it, is to say that there's many flavours to make sustainable fuels using solar energy as the driving force. They potentially all have different applications and different costs, and they're at different levels of development. But they all have some common features. They all have the light absorption, the charge separation, and what I'm particularly interested in, the catalysis and those catalysts that sit on the surface. They're often the same catalysts in the electrolyzer, as in the photoelectrochemical cell, as on the semiconductor material. Here you'll see your iridium oxides made a reappearance. And we also should think about the variety of different fuels we can make. So everything so far has been protons through to hydrogen. 
but we can keep this oxidation reaction exactly the same. So our source of electrons remains water. And we can change our reduction reaction. So we can go to, for example, carbon dioxide to make carbon based molecules. And I've shown the simplest reduction of CO2, the two electron, two proton reduction to make carbon monoxide. But we could do multiple electron, multiple proton reductions to make far more complex molecules, for example, ethylene in CO2 reduction. And now we've got access to storable carbon fuels and feedstocks. Or we could do nitrogen reduction. And again, Imperial's a, a hotbed for this. We could do nitrogen and take this through to ammonia. So it's a very powerful concept and it's almost not quite toolbox, but we can take apart and deconvolute it into separate sections. And we can start to see how this underlying approach can be used to make a whole range of different sustainable fuels and molecules. And when I was introduced, I was introduced as the lead for the solar fuels network, and that's only partially true. We recognize this as a community and the solar fuels network is actually changing and it's becoming the solar chemicals network as a result of this. So the solar chemicals network is in recognition of the fact that we can use solar energy to drive the production of many different molecules. So, for example, we could make ammonia or we can make hydrogen or any number of different carbon materials. And this is an exciting possibility. We can now go beyond our chemical fuels into a right range of molecules for transportation, for consumer goods, for agriculture. And for me, this is fantastic. It's sort of a really exciting opportunity to bring sustainability into the chemicals industry. And where I want to spend most of this talk talking is actually on this last part here, the carbon dioxide chemistry. So my group in Liverpool has spent quite a number of years now looking at CO2 electrochemistry and CO2 photochemistry. And we're really interested in it, as I say, because it offers a pathway to make carbon materials and molecules. And we know that society is going to continue to need these. And it also offers a way to valorize captured carbon dioxide. And that's important when we're starting to think about the economics of these processes. And you'll see lots of diagrams like this, which are not quite cyclical. If you squint sideways, you can see they're more circular than the current linear carbon path that is employed. And what we're really interested in doing is taking one of those first devices I showed, an electrolyzer, and swapping out the cathode reaction for a CO2 reduction cathode. And to see if we can make this thing work and to bring it up to the levels of activity currently seen in the hydrogen evolution devices. But there's challenges. So here's my potential versus RHE. So this is just potential versus a standard uh, scale. And here's my two reactions. So I've got an anode reaction, which we've talked about, which is water oxidation. So my electrolyzer can have the same anode as my green hydrogen electrolyzer. But the cathode, so there's the anode. But the cathode here, which is the catalyst is going to be these little red dots here, needs to be able to selectively produce the carbon product I want. And that's really tough. Look at all these different pathways my CO2 can go down by these different multi electron, multi proton processes. And also, look at this fella here hydrogen evolution. Usually, we think hydrogen being produced, great, it's a fuel. But if I want to make a carbon product and I'm using up all my charge in hydrogen evolution, I've got a very low efficiency and a separation problem downstream, and that's going to be bad. So, this is a nice problem for catalysis. How do we actually run this thing at high current densities and get selectivity? Well, the first thing to do is to make sure that we bring in the CO2 at high concentration. So we bring the CO2 into a porous electrode, a gas diffusion electrode. We may also get rid of the liquid electrolytes to so bring it in direct contact with a polymer electrolyte. And the devices I'll show are in this form. So they're what we call a zero gap structure. But we need to have a bit more think about our chemistry. And for many years, I think the community probably didn't. And many people were working on CO2 electrolysis, merrily making these gas diffusion electrodes and reporting remarkable carbon efficiencies. They were getting 90, 95% of their charge going to make carbon-based products. And they were doing this with a membrane to separate out the device, which is which was an anion exchange membrane. They were running the system at high pH. And what we should all remember from our chemistry at GCSE level or high school, depending on where we came from, the carbon dioxide plus base will form a bicarbonate or a carbonate, depending on the pH. 
And if I've got an anion exchange membrane, my CO2 comes in the back, reacts rapidly, shoots across through the anion exchange membrane, gets to the anode where the pH is going to be much higher, reforms the CO2 and shoots out the exhaust. So all that wonderful CO2 I've captured from my plant and purified is lost. And often you'd see that in, when people actually worked out where the CO2 went, more was being lost than was being converted, which clearly isn't sustainable. These calculations aren't mine, but people in this paper here have estimated about 55% of the operating costs will come from trying to solve this carbonate problem if you run this device structure. So instead, we might want to work in an acid. We're not going to get carbonate formation, but now low pH, hydrogen dominates. So how do we solve that problem? Well, the conventional electrodes that you would use are based on metals such as gold, silver, tin, copper. They all make hydrogen quite readily. They're not fantastic hydrogen evolution surfaces. But they'll make hydrogen quite readily at low pH. So our approach has been to try and look at very selective molecular electrocatalysts. And some of this work actually dates back to Imperial. So I was here at Imperial 10 years ago. And we started looking at this class of catalysts known as cyclams, nickel cyclams. And we keep on trying to stop looking at them, but we never get the chance. And the reason we're interested in these is that we've done loads of different modifications of nitrogen, off the carbons, all over the place, is that they have very good activity and selectivity for CO2 reduction at low pHs. So they're active and selective for CO2 reduction to CO at pH 2, which is about the pH we'd operate our cathode at and our gas diffusion electrode. And this is a particularly interesting one where you just stick a carboxylic acid group on the end and it shows a big kick on in the behavior. So this red line here is in, we've got a higher current, it's telling us we're getting lots of carbon dioxide reduction happening at more positive potentials. And over the years, we've developed these with the team at University of Cambridge, with Erwin Reisner's team, and a number of different studies where we've used these as photocatalytic systems. So here we found that we can actually drive directly the reduction of carbon dioxide to CO and minimize hydrogen production with these catalysts. So we knew they were probably selective enough, but what we've done in the last two to three years is now try to use these in the gas diffusion electrodes. So let's have a quick look at how these get on. So how do we go about actually doing this? So here's an electrolyzer we might make. So when we start developing a catalyst, we often work the catalyst in solution dissolved up and we do homogeneous electrocatalysis or we absorb it onto the electrode surface and we work at low current densities. When we want to develop its use a bit more, we want to put it onto these porous carbon electrodes, these gas diffusion layers. And what we end up doing actually is remarkably simple. You develop a formulation with a series of uh, solvents, um, ionomous solutions as well to help with ion transport through it, the material, and then additives such as PTFE to control the uh, moisture and the, the water penetration into the device. And then you spray these onto your porous support and you make your electrode. And if we do this, we can look at things like XPS spectroscopy and we can see that our catalyst survives and it's in the same form as when we started. We haven't destroyed it in our formulation process and in our processing. So we often have to do a bit of heating here. And when we used our CO2 catalysts at very low pH, we used them in a slightly different sort of device. We used something called a bipolar membrane electrolyzer. And a bipolar membrane electrolyzer is really interesting because it's actually a cation exchange and an anion exchange layer sandwiched together. So what it's good at doing is transporting cations in one direction and anions in the other. And at the interface of this material, we can have water dissociation. So we feed this membrane combination water and it's fed water at the anode and we just feed the device pure water, in fact, ultra pure water. Water is transported into the membrane structure and at the interface, we get water dissociation occurring. And this water dissociation then leads to proton transport to the cathode, so I get my low pH I wanted, and anion transport to the anode, which is really good because you're in water oxidation, working at high pH is really beneficial. It allows you to move away from those very expensive iridium catalysts. So we make this device and we know we've got a low pH at the cathode and we put in a silver electrode, so silver shown here in black, and the solid lines is the amount of carbon dioxide it makes and it's very small so the Faraday coefficient is the percentage of charge going to the particular reaction so 80 percent of charge makes hydrogen with a conventional catalyst and a year ago we were really really happy that we got up to sort of 40 50 percent of charge going to our carbon monoxide so we were making carbon monoxide and hydrogen in about a one-to-one -one 
ratio, which is not a bad situation to be in. You can then tweak your ratios and then get into syngas. This is quite cool. So pure water, pure CO2, we can come to that point, making syngas popping out at the end. Cell voltages are pretty poor if you work in the electrolyzer field and current densities are well below where we need to be for a practical device. But still, no carbonate crossover or very, very little. There's problems. Our catalyst uh, is deactivated by its product, which is never a good thing for a catalyst. So it binds CO and then you can over reduce it and it becomes dead, essentially. So if you run the device and leave it running, it slowly gets worse. You turn it off, it partially recovers and it continues to get worse. So that's a, a big problem. But actually, recently we found we can largely overcome this with operating protocols. So slightly inspired by what was happening elsewhere in electrolyzer technology, we've started to employ very fast pulse trains in electrolysis. So we do milliseconds, 40 milliseconds or 200 millisecond pulses. And we drive the catalyst from this state back to its active form. So we don't let this species build up. And that really helps us actually run this thing for a lot, lot longer, which is pretty cool. And we can actually improve the selectivity quite a lot. So this is actually taken in a, in a conventional cell. It does also work in an electrolyzer, but you can see in a conventional cell, we can work up and actually get it nearly completely selective for CO production. And that becomes very stable over a long period. So in principle, we can solve that problem. But our current densities are very, oh, so here's what I'm saying, we, we drive the, we allow the catalysis, and then we drive the potential up, we destabilize this intermediate, go back to our nickel species here, and then we're ready to do our catalysis again. So we run this at about five hertz, and we have about 40 millisecond things. So we've got a very good duty cycle for electrolysis, which is pretty cool. But the current densities are very low, and that's largely because we actually put loads and loads of our nickel catalysts down. But 95, 96% is inactive. It doesn't, it's just not electroactive. We can't see it electrochemically. We suspect we're getting very poor adhesion to the carbon support. So we've developed catalyst derivatives with things like pyrenes on them. I'm a terrible wet chemist, as several people know here, but even we can make this and it's pretty stable. And this means we've got an anchoring group. So there's a pi pi interaction to the, our carbon support here. I've shown it on a carbon nanotube. This was the paper where we described it, where Francesco, one of our PhD students, described how we could make this and showed it sol a solution electrochemistry. And what you can see is that when we run this thing in solution, we can get quite significantly higher catalyst activity and we can do loading studies and we can see we can get much higher loading activities. But it comes at a cost and functionalizing this, we upset the structures of this nickel catalyst and the selectivity dies off a little bit. But we're still below where we need to be in terms of current density. So now we're looking at new catalysts and this actually just came out today in, in advanced materials interfaces. And we've looked at a number of catalysts. We've looked at manganese based catalysts. I, I won't have time to talk about those, but we're now looking at cobalt based catalysts. So this is a very well known species. It's been looked at since the 80s, I think. Yeah, 1980s. And we had a look and there was a number of cobalt species that were reported to work at quite low pH. So we suspected the cobalt phallocyanin, this molecule here, would also work pretty well. And now we formulate the electrode in exactly the same way. We have to put in some carbon filler. These things are very specific about how they sit on the carbon support. And you can see this is, it was called formulation two for a while, uh, but that was just because the, um, the commercialization team got overexcited. Um, I can tell you it's the a cobalt phallocyanin. Um, and this has gone out on YouTube. I mean, up to four people might see it. So. This thing is much, much more active. We can run this at several hundred milliamps per square centimeter. The Faraday coefficients aren't great with this particular setup, feeding it pure water, but they're acceptable, 20, 30 percent. So roughly speaking, three hydrogens to one carbon monoxide. If you're in the syngas field, that's not bad. You could work with that. And it's much, much more stable. What kills us now isn't the catalyst dying. It's actually a problem that many people have. It's that water penetrates through the cathode structure and floods it. We haven't got the formulation right. We need to get the PTFE loadings and the other species correct. Anyone who works in fuel cells will be sat there thinking, ah, they've got a lot to learn. And we do as a field. We've really got to sort out the formulations to stop these things flooding. But this operates at high current densities and at lower current densities, you get 70 plus percent. 
selectivity for CO. And we can actually improve it quite a lot further. I'll come to that in a second. Um, I guess the next point is we can get very high because we're now not losing the CO2 across the device. We can get single pass conversion efficiencies just by turning down the gas flows above 50%. So 50% of the CO2 net hour is being converted when we take this into the device. But we've got problems. Uh, you probably can't see it on this screen. You might just be able to make it out down there. This is a breakdown of the cell voltage. And you can see that the cell voltages are extraordinarily high. So for our starting device, five plus volts for 200 milliamps per square centimeter. That is appalling, um, generally terrible. The electrical energy coefficients for these are appalling. And a large part of this is coming from the water dissociation in the bipolar membrane. And the bipolar membrane water dissociation step is not very efficient, but there's a wonderful paper from uh, the Oregon team, Ashan Boschters. And if you stick things such as uh, metal oxide, such as TiO2 into the interface, you can actually really lower this, this. And also by changing the anion exchange and the cation exchange layer material around, you can really lower the, the, the cell resistance. So all our starting work was done with commercial fumoset bipolar membranes, and they're fine, but they don't work at high current densities and yeah, they're quite high resistance. So you can swap this out, but it comes at a bit of a cost. This is quite a lot. I had a big argument for review. This is quite a lot more acidic under our operating conditions. It's not inherently more acidic, our cation exchange layer. This is NAFAON now. Um, it's just under our operating conditions, the proton flux is quite high. So we can lower our cell voltage quite a lot by redesigning our membrane. We can also do a second thing. You'll notice here that the over potentials, we can only really uh, disentangle it to cathode and anode over potential combined. You'll notice that, that uh, these are very, very large on the order of a volt and a half. We can do a bit through the formulation of the cathode, but the biggest thing we can do is really push the pH at the anode. So we flow pure water in usually, but if we flow KOH solution in now, we can start to really lower the anode over potential. And you can see a massive drop in the cell voltage, and that's primarily due to the fact that we're just using KOH now. We were surprised though when we did this. So I said to the postdoc to do this and they did it and uh, they came back and said, we've got a very odd result. It's got a lot better. Uh, well, that's a good odd result. But we looked at what happened at the cathode. Now this is a bipolar membrane. So anions flow that way, cations flow that way. If I put a cation here, it shouldn't be able to get across to here at a high rate. The reality is there is co-ion crossover and it does happen but we weren't expecting a lot of it. So when he said the cathode had changed a lot because we'd changed the nature of the anode, the analyte, I was really quite surprised. And we found that we could get very high Faraday coefficients even at high current densities. This is done with a fumoset and we can't go high, but we suspect this thing will continue on quite happily for, for a, a lot further and we're looking at that now. And the reason for this became apparent when we started to dig into the literature. So actually potassium crossover is known to happen at reasonable levels. And we've proved it's potassium crossover by just putting, using pure water and putting a dot of potassium chloride on our cathode and drying it and then sticking it on. The presence of potassium really improves the selectivity of our catalyst, which is quite cool. And when we were writing this, a paper came into a preprint server, you can just see it here, from uh, Toyota Central R&D Labs, where they'd been working on this catalyst for quite a long time themselves. And they said, really interesting, if you put potassium in, the selectivity greatly improves. We went, oh yeah, we'd agree with that. And they'd done quite a lot of DFT and they assign it to the fact that when you put the potassium in, it stabilizes the CO2 adduct and it stabilizes it in a more central position directly over the coal. Otherwise there's a tendency for the CO2 to twist and lean to one side a bit more. And then there's a higher energy pathway. And that seems pretty sensible to us that this potassium is having a really, really important role. So we got a double win, essentially, in this device. We were really quite pleased. We'd both lowered the uh, cell over potential and we'd improved the selectivity. And now we're running this at really quite high current densities. And the next step is now to put in these customized membranes and see if we can lower this cell voltage further still. Last two minutes, because we're now working at high pH, we can play around a bit with our anode catalyst. So that the eagle eyed of views will notice the fact that I said, I'm working for bipolar membranes. It allows me to get away from those horrible iridium and ruthenium catalysts, which are 
very expensive, they dissolve and come away. We used ruthenium oxide all the way through this, uh, primarily because it's a useful benchmark. Um, and also just because we were trying to find our feet and sort of we felt dealing with the cathode was enough. But now we can start to use alternative catalysts at the anode. So we're starting and for a couple of years we've been doing this behind the scenes, looking at alternative anode catalysts. And these are ones that only work at high pH. They're no good for replacement in your PEM electrolyzer. They'll just dissolve. So that's straight off. But what we're interested in trying to do is to work with things like cobalt based catalysts and improve their activity. So this is with a very good uh, chemist who's actually moved to an academic post in Slovenia now, and one of my colleagues, Malik Patel at Liverpool, and also a colleague, University of Mumbai, looking at transition metal borides and how if we make a transition metal boride, we can also add in extra elements. So, for example, iron. And we can really see a large improvement in the OER activity. So here's the, the linear sweep voltammetry. And what we're looking for is as high a current density as, as uh, low a potential as possible. And you can see versus our benchmark ruthenium oxide, which is in our green, our cobalt iron oxyboride material can actually outperform this under the conditions used. And this, to be honest, we're still trying to work out why it is the case. But what we do know is that when you make these materials, you initially make a cobalt iron oxy oxide material, and then you do a sodium borohydride treatment. And you end up with a very thin shell of this cobalt boride over the sum of the sample. And this shell is most, uh, it is found when we use a, a small amount of iron as the dopants. It seems to help with the boridization step. And this shell is relatively conductive, which seems to help us quite a lot. Then it enters the alkali solution. and We're going to fit, then form a thin layer of the oxide back over the top of this. And then we can get quite high levels of the key intermediate. And we can see this electrochemically. We can see lots of this nice cobalt free intermediate, which we know is an active site, one of the precursors. So it seems that this rather complex synthesis is just a very effective way of getting a material which is pretty conductive and has a very high density of active sites for the OER reaction. But it's very good because now potentially we can outperform our more expensive catalysts. And these chaps have taken it even further since, and they're now looking at things like the cobalt phosphor borides. And here, um, actually, that should say molybdenum. That's my mistake. That's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> that's just completely wrong. That bit that's off there. <laughs> Let's just ignore that. So the, these are now cobalt molybdenum phosphor boride oxides. So these are really becoming a mouthful. And actually, they're, they're a bit of a dog's dinner as catalysts, but they're remarkably effective. So now we can get, this is the over potential for 10 milliamps per square centimetre. Now we can work at relatively low loadings. And bear in mind, the elements we're using here are considerably cheaper than the sort of iridium and ruthenium ones and get really quite low over potentials for our 10 milliamps per square centimetre. So these catalysts look really promising. So another step now is to feed these into our electrolyzers because these are actually potentially quite useful for us. The summary, um, a talk of two halves, a football pundit would say. In the first half, I tried to give a very general introduction to the field. I was aware that we may have people completely different backgrounds and to try and give an idea of the concept of using solar energy, or in some cases, if you're looking at the plus electrolyzer approach, any renewable to make a storable fuel. And then to show that, or to say that we can get across to actually go beyond fuels and we should start to think about chemical feedstocks more widely. And there's great opportunities there. The second part, I've tried to show that we can take this approach and use it for carbon dioxide chemistry. And this has all been done as part of the UKRI Circular Chemistry Centre. It's got a far longer name that uh, Andreas did a fantastic job of saying. Um, I always get it wrong. So our Circular Economy Centre draws upon these concepts developed through solar fuels to try and actually bring some circularity into carbon cycles. And hopefully I've convinced you there is potential for carbon dioxide reduction with high carbon utilisation efficiencies. And that's really the key. And the way we're doing it's a little bit different with molecular catalysts, but in principle, some of the tricks that we're doing, such as potassium loading the cathode, can work pretty well. It's being shown with more conventional catalysts, such as gold and copper. So there's options to explore this over. All right, just to finish up, there's been a huge number of people who have done this work, and I should just say thank you to many of these. I just want to flag a couple because what they've done, I think, is really quite fantastic. So 
Guy was my first PhD student who now works for a well-known electrolyzer company. Um, and she really kicked off pretty much everything in, in that presentation and is still involved with a lot of the work we do today. So we're very grateful to her. We've also had some fantastic recent PhD students, Francesca and, and Kathy, and we're very grateful to our supporters, which includes companies such as NSG Pilkington, who are, have been a fantastic partner through this project, and also UKRI. I think I'll leave it there. I welcome questions and discussions, and thank you again, Andreas, for the kind invite. Okay, it's uh, question time. Um, I understand that there'll be questions coming in digitally as well as from the audience and we'll sort of yo-yo between the two. So why don't we start off with an in-person question? So, ah. Don't fight with me. Is this working? Yep. Alex, wonderful talk, truly wonderful. Um, Rick Parker, I'm a visiting professor in mechanical engineering. I ran a mile from chemistry as soon as I got out of school, so uh, I won't second guess you on any of that. Um, I just want to take you right back to your starting point, you know, this solar to fuel. It seems to me it's totally specious. The vast amount of the stuff you showed, excellent for electrochemistry, it's totally agnostic where the electrodes, electrons come from. They don't care whether it's solar, nuclear or whatever. And I'd hate the students here to go away thinking, oh, the UK's future is just about, you know, as long as we invest in enough solar power, that's it, we've solved the problem. All the modeling we've done says you need one third renewables, one third carbon uh, gas with carbon capture, one third nuclear. And then, yes, you can do all these wonderful things with whatever the source for electricity is. Uh, so that was my only point, but I, I think the, the electrochemistry you're showing is great. And yes, we definitely need to be able to replicate the production of all the chemicals we currently rely on that come from uh, fossil based uh, fuels. Uh, in, in by synthetic means. And, uh, you know, that's that's the end point for me, not whether it's solar powered or wind powered or whatever. Sorry. No, I, 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 I fully appreciate your point. And I think, yes, the electrochemical systems I've talked about are agnostic to where the electrons, uh, to, to the driving force of these electrons. I completely agree. I think, though, that what I want to highlight is, I, I, I agree, especially somewhere like the UK, it's not going to be solely solar power. Um, there's going to be a balance, there's going to be a mixture. What these sort of technologies do is that they enable you to increase the percentage that could come from solar because they're very compatible with, if we just focus on the electrolyzers, the sort of things we're looking at are pretty compatible with, with, with fluxional loads in principle. We've not gone into that level of detail, but in principle should be fine. And there's fuel storage allows you to up the usage of solar. And I think that's the thing for the UK, you have to couple it with, with, some, with some fuels. The, the more fundamental parts may see applications out, they, they may be out, so for so a photocatalyst, it may be that it's for the UK, but it may be for alternative areas. So for example, where you don't have a developed grid, then a direct solar to X system may, may have a unique position. So. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I wouldn't want people to go away thinking it's it's the only way. We, we're going to need large contributions from wind and from other sources as well. But I think what this solar to X approach does is it really allows you to up the usage of solar energy and get it into many areas. Do we have anything online? OK. Very really nice presentation. So I've seen them conflicting reports in the literature about the prospects of using molecular catalysts mm. for, for making more um, reduced products like methane or methanol. And I've seen some people say yeah. that they can and some others say, well, well what's your own experience? With that? Um, so with the cobalt based catalyst, we've seen traces of methane yeah. um, if you drive these things hard enough, but they are genuinely traces. Um, uh, one, two percent of the products going that way. And it's it seems I'd have to check with Parvin who's done this, but as I recall, it seems to be very pH dependent as well. 
the copper based ones where people are seeing copper molecular catalysts doing this. Um, I mean, there's certainly some reports which are more convincing than others, but there is a big worry that copper can extrude out of the catalyst, form a nanoparticle. You take the sphing apart, oxidizes back, sneaks back into the catalyst, and you do ex situ measurements and you go, my copper's in the same state as it started. Therefore, that's the catalyst. And there's been some wonderful in situ studies that have shown that's not the case. So I, I think these molecular catalysts are not necessarily the best way to do higher carbon products, certainly carbon carbon coupling. I mean, we've only got one active site. It's very hard to see how we're going to bring together two carbons. We'd have to design a biometallic or something. So, uh, When you see high amounts of methane, do you also see high amounts of hydrogen as well? Or? I'll have to go to high. Amount. I mean, when I say high, it's never high amounts. It's, it's like one percent. I mean, there's something similar to what we're seeing. Um, I, can, I can tell you that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, we we do see quite a lot of hydrogen because it, it tends to be if we force this thing to very low pHs deliberately. Um, and I think Mark Cope has seen that. He's also seen that when he pressurized the system. He used a cobalt phthalocyanin, which structurally is very very similar. Uh, no, cobalt protoporphin, uh, which was very very similar. Um, and at high pressures, you also saw methane as well, which is an interesting observation. Thank you, Alex. That was very nice. Um, I've got a question about the last part about your molecular electrocatalysis. Mm. The, the electrocatalysis community has, I think, generally been of the opinion that Molecular electrocatalysis is an interesting model system, but would never be useful. Yes. Um, I think that is a, a, a an understanding which may be shifting yeah. as the turnover numbers of molecular catalysts improve. Are you thinking of your systems as being an interesting model system of how to control seed activity, or do you actually think it might be useful? That's a fantastic question, and one that I if you'd asked me it yesterday, I'd give you a different answer to my answer today. Genuinely, I, I, I sway on my opinion from day to day um, because whenever I think. We haven't got to the conditions where the catalyst dies first with the cobalt ones, with the nickel ones. Absolutely. You can see we're doing some what I think are rather fun things with pulse trains and so on to, to regenerate the catalyst in situ. Yes, those are nice model ones. That is not a sensible catalyst realistically to go forward with. But the cobalt one, the device dies before the catalyst dies. So we get the flooding and, and then problems associated with that. And people have reported turnover numbers as high as 10 to the 6 before, which are, are pretty good. You know, it, it, you're going to need to get better still, but it, it's perfectly possible. So yes, they might be good enough. But when I went into working with the molecular catalysts, I had exactly the viewpoint you described, that it's a wonderful model system to give us some ideas and that we'll eventually turn to the metal systems. So it genuinely depends on, on the day. I, I've been surprised I'm coming around to the idea that molecular catalysts actually could be, could be viable and, and could actually have legs in real devices. Um, Let's start. Okay, let's start with you and then Milo. Okay, I'm not a professor. I'm a professor of statistics, but uh, I just have a very simple question from your point of view. The government has been decided to invest in the blue, green, and all sorts of color of hydrogen. So, 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 so. And now, how does your work tie in with all that? Um, yeah, it, it's difficult to keep up with the colors of hydrogen, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, this would come under green hydrogen, uh, so hydrogen derived from water using renewables. So it it's definitely comes into the green hydrogen, the, the first part of the presentation. And uh, the electrolyzers that we, for example, got out in Tenerife, they are the same electrolyzers that you would use for green hydrogen deployment now. There's only a few companies you can buy from, so they're the same ones. Um, the Carbon work, of course, has potential for integration into other systems, so it might be, I'm, I'm going to be slightly controversial, I'm not a big fan of the concept of blue hydrogen, but it could potentially be integrated into a blue hydrogen type system where you're going to strip out the CO2 and then you, you, you've got to use it or store it, and the current plans are to store it. So it might give you a way then, if you're 
hell bent on as a government on doing blue hydrogen, it might give you a way to access some carbon products without using additional virgin fossil fuel or fossil resource. So it has potential to tie in there, but that's not where I dream of being able to apply the work. Thanks. Hi, Alex. Hello. Great, great to see you and I can see all your, all your fantastic progress. I was interested in your um, transient uh, electrochemistry mm. and I was thinking about all the different transients that might be going on when you change the pulse train yeah. and whether you had any sense of your, whether it's changing concentration gradients of reactants or products or changing pH or the yeah. collapse of the double layer or the formation no, of the double layer or the really. or the change of the oxidation state of the catalyst. I mean, it seems like so much could be going on. Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, we could give a talk just on that. Uh, so the student, Francesca, who, who sort of found this, um, she was driven by the work. So this is an approach used in metal electrodes for CO2 reduction, and they're doing exactly that. They're trying to flip the pH and, and trying to change concentration gradients. So she was driven by that. But what we found is that the potential that we flip to is very, very important. So it's not shown here, but she's done a series of studies where she's changed this anodic uh, step, the potential and moved it up and down. And when she steps across the uh, the uh, oxidation potential of this intermediate the process turns on and off. So we we and we, we've looked at the time dependence of the current. We're pretty confident what we're following here is a Faraday process. So we're pretty confident in this particular case. We're primarily looking at a Faraday process, the reoxidation of this undesired intermediate. I think, though, that what you've flagged up is the wider potential of the approach. So it's being used on um, increasingly so as discussed earlier, just today it's being used in nitrogen reduction on solid electrode interfaces, although I don't think the pulse durations are these millisecond ones, I think there's more sort of seconds. Um, it's being used in the CO2 reduction community on, on uh, oxide derived electrodes and metal electrodes, but again seconds, sometimes even minutes. But I think this very short pulsing is, has got quite a lot of potential more widely to, to literally take the system, shake it up and put it back down again is the way I view it. And you can work for I mean, our duty cycle is like 99% if we do this. So we're not spending lots of time with the system not producing our product. And we're not wasting much charge reoxidizing the product as well. That's the important thing as well. So, yeah, I think in this case we understand it, but we haven't done sort of a detailed study spectroscopically, but you could see that would be fun. Challenging, but fun. Hi, Alex, we just have a question from teams here. James uh, at UCL asks, uh, can you see a future where a carbon tax improves the business case for these technologies? Policy has a critical role to play. So part of the Circular Economy Centre is that we have a, a technology development programme, which is headed up from uh, Team of Liverpool with three or four other partner universities. We also have a team who do the LCA, which was actually uh, Benoit from Imperial, uh, who many of you may know, chemical engineer. And then we also have a policy program and yeah, the policy and the financing side is critical. So you have to get that correct. And perhaps one thing that's going to be key is how we consider the carbon credits related to this. So if I have captured CO2 and I store it and I have some certain carbon credits, then what happens if I use that CO2 and it's only transiently stored? If we don't get that policy and finance environment correct, it will actually make it very difficult to build a business case for carbon utilization because carbon storage will make monetary sense. So we need to be very careful about that. So it's a fantastic question. It's not my area of expertise, I stress, but we do have people in the center who work on that. And yeah, it's critical. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, we have to end it there for questions, but you can carry on with the questions with our drinks reception just outside. So if we'd just like to thank uh, Professor Cowan one more time. Please join us for drinks. <laughs>